Hey, welcome to Planet Earth. It's Friday. We made it. And this was a really fast week, man. I just kind of, it feels like I blinked my eyes. It was suddenly Thursday. Uh, I was really busy this week, doing a lot. So I guess, you know, when, when you're busy, things tend to go by kind of fast. But hey, it doesn't matter. We're here. It's Friday. Doesn't matter how you got here. You made it, man. So what's the best way to kick off the uh, weekend? History, dinosaurs, and football. You've come to the right place. All right, we were talking about the Korean War, America's Forgotten War last time. Here's another one a lot of people forget about, the Barbary Pirates. Who are the Barbary Pirates? They're on the Barbary Coast of North Africa. That's present-day um, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, a little bit of Libya. Now, these guys are pirates, <laughs> and we're not talking pirates of the Caribbean, okay? These guys are really bad news. Killing people, enslaving people, sinking ships, stealing ships. Uh, they were nominally um, vassals of the Ottoman Empire, based way over there in uh, Istanbul slash Constantinople, Turkey. Well, these guys kind of ran around and did what they wanted because they're way out on the edge, right? If you want to send, you know, if their tribute to Constantinople is supposed to be 100 pieces of gold and they send 50, you know, are you going to send an expedition out to get the other 50? It's going to cost more. So they're kind of way out there. They kind of do what they want to do. They send a few bucks back home and everybody leaves them alone. The Mediterranean has always had problems with pirates. This is nothing new. It goes all the way back to ancient times. Remember Pompey over there with the uh, pirates? I made his money. And Julius Caesar, of course, was captured by pirates. They paid the ransom. He told all the pirates would come back one day for all you guys. They laughed at him. And he caught him and crucified him. And, you know, and it goes even further back than that. The Muslim pirates of the Middle Ages, of course. And uh, 1177 B.C., the Sea Peoples. We're still not sure who those guys were exactly. But, oh, did they wreak a lot of havoc. So the Barbary pirates just laid us in a long line of pirates in the Mediterranean. So who are these guys? There you are. They're in the Mediterranean. Mainly a Mediterranean menace. You like that Mediterranean menace? If I ever become a professional wrestler, I'm going to use that, uh, the Mediterranean menace. Of course, they move out to the Atlantic a little bit, but they're not really just confined to this area. I, I mean, they are very good sailors, and sailing in the Mediterranean is a lot different than sailing out in the Atlantic. It's easier in the Mediterranean. You, don't, you, you get some really nasty storms, don't get me wrong, but um, it's usually calmer than, say, the North Atlantic. But the fact they can sail out into the Atlantic tells you that they're really, really good sailors. There's a slave trade happening out there in the um, outside of Africa. Africa is the one you hear most about because, you know, American history and all of that. But slave trading has been happening even in Europe for a while, even though it was illegal. It's because they picked up slaves through raids. Now, you know, the Crimean Tatars, they were, you know, grabbing people out of Russia the Ottomans were uh, stealing people out of the Balkans. And, of course, they grabbed people out of the Middle East and Africa, too. They weren't really um, too, um, too discriminating. They grab anybody. But I want you to look at those red lines. Okay, that's where the Barbary pirates would go. And look, you know, I thought there was a Mediterranean menace. Look, they reach out to the Atlantic. They hit the uh, Netherlands one time. They hit Ireland once. And look at that. 1627, they hit Iceland. Remember, that's sailing in the North Atlantic, even in summer. That's different than the Mediterranean. So these guys are very good sailors and very good raiders. Remember the Vikings? Same idea. Long-distance raids. I, I'm still stunned about the, well, the first time I read about them hitting Iceland. And this thing about Copenhagen here, I, I don't know if they actually got that far, but I wouldn't put it past them. You know, and I know they made it to English Channel a few times so was back in the 16 or 1700s where the Royal Navy really got rolling. After about 1700 or so, forget it, they're not getting into English Channel. But they tend to hang around out there in the western Mediterranean. Yes, they hit Italy a few times. It's almost like the Punic Wars never ended. <laughs> and uh, they're just bad news all around, man. But Barbary pirates. The reason um, they're really bad news, could the great powers of Europe especially in the 1700s and 1800s, could they get together and destroy the Barbary, Barbary pirates? Sure, they could. I mean, if they really made a concerted effort, any one of these countries, Britain, France, Spain, even Portugal, could probably wipe them out. 
But you remember, too, they're going to be fighting in the French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars. But even without that, it's just easier to, to, to pay them off. You bribe them. So the day of Algiers or the Saleh Rovers over here, they just, you know, they pick up the money and they leave your ship alone. Britain says, I'll pay you this. You leave the British Navy alone. They see a British flag. They stay away from it. They know better than to fight the British toe-to-toe. -to -toe. But, you know, the British is cheaper. It's cheaper. It's easier. You pay them off. They leave you alone, right? And that's kind of the idea. France and, you know, Spain would do this too. But Portugal never did. And believe it or not, neither did Sweden. So always fighting. Now, when the United States came along, have a bit of a problem. Because when you're a colony, you're a British ship. And they knew better to mess with a British ship. And now with this American flag, and no one knows what it is yet, going to be a bit of a problem. In fact, the first U.S. ship to be taken by the Barbary Pirates, the Saleh Rovers over there in uh, Morocco facing the Atlantic, was the USS Betsy. They grab it and they hold people ransom. If you don't pay the ransom, hey, you lose the ship. Maybe they sink the ship and your crew gets sold into slavery. They might even execute them, but probably sell them into slavery because they make some money off these guys. So, what do you do about it? Well, like I said, when you were part of the British Empire, they didn't mess with you. When you're the United States and you just got started a few years earlier, not really sure what to do. It's a civilian ship. You're not really equipped to fight off pirates. It's been a long time, you know. Uh, Blackbeard's been dead for, you know, over 100 years. And you're also dealing with a different set of pirates over in the Mediterranean. Thomas Jefferson does what he does best. He negotiates. So the first U.S. foreign treaty, somebody outside of Europe, was with Morocco. They talked to the Sally Rovers over there, and, you know, there's a bribe involved. And they say, we will not mess with American ships anymore. In fact, they even promised, it was put in the treaty, that if uh, American captives from another Barbary state showed up in Morocco in the slave markets, they would immediately free the Americans. Now, whether they kept their word on this or not, it's very hard to verify then and now, but there it was in the treaty. So you've dealt with one Barbary pirate, but... Yeah, you can't really negotiate with the rest of them quite the same way. And quite frankly, I'm shocked they actually managed to get a treaty with Morocco. Thomas Jefferson, he's a Democratic Republican. That means he believes in a small government, states' rights kind of guy. He doesn't want the government spending a lot of money. And he ends up turning into a Federalist. How does this happen? Well, if your first thought was scumbag politician, I don't blame you. But the, the truth is, situation and circumstances change. When he was a candidate, certainly, he's not expanding the government. He believes in a strict interpretation of the Constitution. But then when you get into office, things tend to change sometimes. Because now, instead of on the campaign trail, you got to deal with the other party. In this case, the Federalists. Maybe you got a majority, maybe you don't. And they're outside circumstances, like uh, New Orleans, for instance. Right? The Spanish, later the French, had the possibility of cutting off the trade from the West. He's got to do something about this, and the Constitution says nothing at all about purchasing foreign territory, but you needed to get New Orleans. So, $15 million goes to Napoleon, the offer for New Orleans, he gives them all of Louisiana. Doesn't say like something a Democratic Republican would do, but need to be done at the time. Other problem here with these Barbary pirates. I don't want, he doesn't want to expand the military, he got the expansion of government power, but there's a problem here. Yeah, tribute to the Barbary Pirates is taking up 16% of the U.S. budget. You could do a lot with 16% of anybody's budget, and he's sending it over to the Barbary Pirates, hoping they don't raid his ships. And you know something? There was a time that number was zero. All right, so, and that number is currently 16, and it's not going to shrink. Because these pirates are going to keep raiding your ships. They're going to chase American shipping out of the out of the Mediterranean. And you've seen how these guys will reach out into the Atlantic. They're just going to follow you until you stop them. There was also a rumor one time the Barbary pirates were sailing off the coast of Maryland. Uh, it was never confirmed, but you can see how far these guys can reach. So definitely in the realm of possibility. So how are you going to smash these pirates into the ground or water, drown them, and uh, yeah, how are you going to do that? You know, because you got to keep doing this. There's Admiral Bainbridge, who's giving tribute to the day of Algeria. Brings the money. They force him to grovel and all this stuff. And do you know he sailed on a ship called the USS George Washington? And they made him take that ship 
all the way to the Ottoman, his alleged Ottoman overlord to deliver the tribute of Algeria. Yeah. So now not only do they have you handing over money, they got you as a delivery boy. And it's not like you're delivering pizza to somebody. So you got to do something about these guys. And they are thinking long and hard. They come up with an idea. Let's get some allies. Right? The Kingdom of Naples, Kingdom of Sicily, later the Kingdom of Two Sicilies. And I already mentioned Sweden was fighting against the pirates. They were never going to give any tribute. So these aren't exactly major powers, but hey, you got three small countries, better one small country taking on the Barbary pirates. So we've got a kind of not a formal alliance, but we've kind of got an understanding. The Swedish and American ships look out for each other. Sicilian, American, Swedes, they'll look out for each other. They let us rent the naval base down there in Syracuse to attack against Barbary pirates. But what are you going to attack them with? Yep, the original six, I call them the OGs of the U.S. Navy. These six frigates are built by uh, Thomas Jefferson, which means more money, expansion of government power, the stuff he did not want to do, but he kind of has to because circumstances forced it on him. The USS United States, the USS Constellation, the USS Constitution, the USS Chesapeake, the USS Congress, and the USS President. And all the other ships they have, they upgrade them, put guns. These six, 38 guns. So they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with uh, almost any European ship of the line. Not quite, a little bit smaller. They could, they could take on the Barbary pirates out on the ocean with no problem. We've got guns. We've got Marines to jump across. Take their ships and sink them for a change or maybe keep them as war trophies. You get in close and shell their uh, shell the, the day's palace, which happened a few times. Problem with uh, Tunis and, uh, and all these places that they got these uh, in the Mediterranean. The closer you get to the beach, you start seeing these shoals. They're called rocks that stick out, so you can't really sail in. So, you know, you can shell them all day, but until you land soldiers on it, you know, you're not going to crush the pirates completely. That happened to us there. The USS Philadelphia, another ship we built. Bainbridge, again, he, he had a little bit of revenge motive here against the Barbary pirates. They were shelling the day of Tunis over there. I mean, uh, yeah. And he tried to get in close, got stuck out on the rocks, and the pirates swarmed over and captured the Philadelphia. That's the uh, Edward Preble was the admiral in charge of the whole operation. He, he tried to warn Bainbridge, watch out for those shoals and those rocks, and you know, he got caught on there. And down below there, Stephen Decatur, who is he? He's an officer on that ship who escaped. They hijack a, a Tripolian, right, Libyan ship, and uh, you know, they, they jump back on the Philadelphia, they burn it down with the pirate crew in it, <laughs> and they win the war against Tripoli. That was, that was the main blow. The, now, the, the final blow came from the Battle of Derna. Now, the guy over here on the left is the uh, consulate for the Ottoman Empire, the American consulate of the Ottoman Empire in Egypt. His name is William Eaton. The other guy, the younger-looking guy, U.S. Marine Corps, Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon. Uh -huh, here we go, right? The shores of Tripoli. So what they do is they mount an expedition from Egypt. Didn't really tell the Ottomans about it. We're Americans. We don't ask permission. We just go out and do it. And they go across the desert along the coastline, and they attack their major city called Derna because the Barbary pirates had an internal problem going on between two brothers who wanted the throne. So they made contact with one brother and said, we put you on the throne, you leave our ships alone. He thinks it's a great idea, so off they go. They've got eight Marines with them and a bunch of uh, Arab and even Greek uh, mercenaries to take on the rather small armed forces of the Barbary pirates, mostly Navy. They don't have that big an army. The army is a sailor who's not quite on the boat right now. They march to a place there called Derna. They fight it out and they smash the Barbary pirates platoon-sized armed forces into the ground, the Battle of Derna. That's where you get the shores of Tripoli from there in the Marine Corps anthem. So Derna goes down. We put our guy on the throne. They leave our ships alone for a while anyway, right? It's a big victory in 1805. They leave us alone. They come back and they raid again, 1814, 1815. We're tied up with the British. Then we have to come back and bomb them again. They left us alone. The Barbary pirate... Um, Menace is finally put down for good when the French invade Algeria in 1830. They don't bother just sitting out there shelling and, you know, because of the shoals. They actually land opposite and, you know, go on land and conquer Algeria in 1830. So, I guess the French came in handy for us there. But, you know, they're not going to mess with our ships ever again. That's why we're always kind of 
We're always kind of uh, prickly about people messing with our ships. Don't like that. It's not good for business. Hey, here's an interesting dude. Who's Richard Owen? Well, Richard Owen, he's British, lived in London. Kind of a weird dude. Didn't have a lot of friends. Didn't care to have a lot of friends. His best friends are right there. Skeletons. This is the man who invented dinosaurs. Yep, he came up with the name. Dinosaurus. Dinos terrible saurus. Lizard. Terrible lizards. There he is with a skull of a crocodile. As you guessed, he is kind of an odd dude, but people actually seem to like him. I have no idea how he uh, got married, and uh, I'm really, really shocked he didn't get divorced because he talked to the London Zoo and he said any animal dies, he gets first shot at dissecting him. And his wife came home one day and found a dead rhinoceros in the kitchen. So, uh, like I said, no idea how that guy's marriage held together. Uh, anyway, as he got older, he became more personable, oddly enough. Had to have with a lot of friends. His nickname was Old Bones. He invented the dinosaur, Dinosauria. He wasn't really sure what it was. Nobody had really bought into the evolution thing yet, that new theory from... Uh, from Darwin, most people had taken the biblical uh, biblical belief that the world had been created in 4004 BC. Uh, then they decided maybe it's 25 million years old. They haven't come up yet with carbon dating. And so dinosaurs fit in there somewhere, but no one's really sure what they were. And people have been finding dinosaur bones forever, but no one really sh was sure what they were. A lot of people thought they were bones from dragons, which you know makes sense, but turns out it's really not. Or we don't think they are anyway. But old bones here, Sir William, uh, Sir William Owen, uh, Sir Richard Owen, sorry, was uh, turned into kind of a celebrity there for a while. And the older he got, the more famous he was. And, you know, then he ended up dying. <laughs> anyway, his nickname was Old Bones, and he was very, very proud of that. He didn't care to be called Sir Richard. He said, just call me Old Bones and bring any dead animals you have. I look at that name, Old Bones. And I wonder if that was the inspiration of Bones McCoy of Star Trek. I'm not really a Trekkie, but I do know who this guy is. And I saw a debate the other day. Do you like the one from the 60s or the early 21st century? You know, yeah, I'm kind of more of the early 21st century. But, you know, when it comes to space stuff, I'm kind of more of a Predator and Aliens kind of guy. But I digress. The very first dinosaur ever identified and marketed by Sir Richard Owen, was the Megalosaurus. Megalo, large lizard, saurus, large lizard. And remember how we talked about how it's hard to reconstruct animals sometimes? Well, we have a lot of knowledge of dinosaurs, and sometimes we make mistakes, but remember, Sir Richard Owen is starting from scratch. No one knows anything about these bones, and sometimes they're partial. So he's in England, and he's done with Jurassic Park fossils. Some megalosaurus lived in a Jurassic Park. And look at that around circa 1880. He figured that's what it looked like. But then he noticed the legs, the front legs were, you know, they didn't seem thick enough to support the weight of something that looked like that. Because the idea of a bipedal reptile was just kind of uh, unknown. But, you know, the, the legs in the front are too small. The legs are very in the back are much thicker. He knows all about animal anatomy, and so, well, you know what? Maybe this thing walks on two legs, and there we are. Everyone accepts it walks on two legs. So around 1900, they figure that's kind of what a megalosaurus looked like. They, they think it was almost that, you know, you see the early 21st century, almost straight, upright posture, but they got the tail. So a lot of people thought that's what it looked like. In the late 20th century, early 21st century, our depiction of dinosaurs has them leaning forward with tails to counterbalance which makes a lot more sense to be honest with you why would you drag your tail around it's got to hurt after a while so you keep the tail upright which means it leans forward which means this thing can really move it could stand up uh, upright if it has to but it, this thing probably runs with the, the balanced look over there and it could really move now they actually made a, tried to turn us into a tourist attraction. So there we are, Megalosaurus, and later on, Iguanodon looks something like this, Crystal Palace Park in London. Just imagine some drunk guy coming from a, ho a hockey game. Some drunk guy coming from a soccer match, all right, and it's dark, and he's, you know, inebriated, and he sees this in the distance. <laughs> I mean, they must have really scared the daylights out of some people, man. Great Britain, it's a weird place, dude. So let's take a closer look at the moderate-ish Megalosaurus. 
So, you know, it's not the biggest, it's definitely not a threat to T-Rex or anything, but it could definitely mess a human being up. So we're looking about, I don't know, it's about 10 feet tall maybe, if it stands straight up. It looks approximately 27 to 30 feet long, kind of a longish tail. And I think this is much more accurate than the quote-unquote classic megalosaurus, because this is an animal that clearly can move fairly quickly. Got those wide jaws, so the tail's got to counterbalance everything. Why does it have a tail? It's a reptile, man. They started with tails, they still got them. It's counterbalance. Hey, here's a guanodon. It lived at the same time as Megalosaurus. We know this because of Sir Richard Owen. He found the skeleton, tried to put them together, and the thing he couldn't figure out was why there were two horns. It was supposed to be a horn on his nose. Where's the second horn go? Again, we looked at the legs and said, yeah, maybe it does, maybe it's not a four-legged animal. Maybe it does walk on two legs, though those front legs do seem kind of thick. Trying to figure out what's up there with the horn and why there's two of them. You're pretty sure he figured out it wasn't on the head. He kind of took a guess. That's where we come up with the classic iguanodon. We know what the, uh, what kind of trees and and everything that were in England at the time, and this thing's clearly a plant eater because, you know, the teeth were uh, not sharp. They're for grinding stuff, kind of like an iguana, right? Iguana don, iguana tooth. So clearly this thing reached up into the trees to eat stuff. Now, what happened with the horn? The horn's actually the thumb. They figure it was kind of a defense mechanism. Megalosaurus comes after him. He jabs him with the thumbs, and I'll be honest with you, man. It looks like that would hurt. So it's got looking a lot like an upright iguana, working with the uh, with the knowledge they had at the time. And, you know, as life goes on, the remains and skeletons are reinterpreted and they put them back together again. And we come up with something in 2020. It looks kind of like what they had in 1850. There you are in 1850. Looks like an elephant with a horn. 1880s, around 1960s or so, they call it the kangaroo pose with the thumb spike. So in our more recent and enlightened age of the 21st century we think it probably walked around on four legs though it does rear up on two you know to reach up to eat stuff in trees and if it comes under attack still has those thumb spikes kind of like uh, a ground sloth later on right walks around on four rears up when it has to so that's what they're thinking the iguanodon looks like and in 20 years who knows it could probably be wearing a football helmet <laughs> Speaking of football helmets, oh man, we're not going to get too deep into the latest Steeler game. It wasn't really that great. We lost to Houston 30-6. to My cousin texted me and said, hey, did you watch the game? I said, no, I actually missed it, which was just as well. He said, did you watch the highlights? I'm like, no, I didn't watch the highlights. I know what a pair of successful field goals look like. The big problem was uh, starting quarterback Kenny Pickens caught a helmet on the knee. I've had that happen, and believe me, that hurts. So uh, they, they thought the injury is much worse than it is because people always think in worst-case scenarios. It's an evolutionary thing that got us to where we are today. Turns out his knee is actually okay. It was a deep bruise. They brought in Trubisky. We still lost. And so he says he's ready to go for the next game. And he probably is. I don't doubt it. But um, you know what? They got the Baltimore Ravens coming up and then a bye week. So my humble opinion to Coach Tomlin is maybe you ought to let Kenny take a break, sit this one out, and heal up this week, and you heal up the bye week and back at it. Now, why do I advise this course of action? Because Baltimore and Pittsburgh, it's basically a brawl, and there's a couple misdemeanors that should probably come out of some of these fights. Oh, believe me, Pittsburgh and Baltimore, even when nothing's at stake, they fight each other like there is no tomorrow. Way back in 2001, I remember they were playing at Heinz Field, now Akershire Stadium. They were fighting it out with each other, and they almost had a fight down at the bottom of the pile because the former Steeler, Raven at the time, Rod Woodson, claimed somebody was trying to jab at him in the eyes through the face mask. <laughs> Another guy claimed one of the Steelers players bit him at the bottom of a pile somewhere. <laughs> yeah, these guys, they uh, yeah, they don't like each other. It doesn't matter what the record is. They really do not like each other. And if I had a weird-looking bird on the side of my helmet and the bees backwards on one side, I might have a bit of an attitude problem as well. But you know what? I don't care. You're the enemy. You're going to lose. You're coming to Akershire Stadium. Uh, 
uh, a very strange statistic in this series is that quite often the visiting team wins. But, you know, we're, we're not going to have that happen this time around. No, no, no. We're going to be waiting for him. Doesn't matter who our quarterback is. We're going to take down the Baltimore Ravens because we know what to do. These are two guys you got to take care of. Quarterback there is Lamar Jackson. Good quarterback. Good scrambler. Remember, reminds people Michael Vick. A lot of people said his passing game was a little suspect, but last week he tore through the Browns for four touchdowns. Okay, I know what you're thinking. It's the Cleveland Browns. But nonetheless, four equals four, so keep an eye on him. You keep him in the pocket, right? He can't run. Oh, he's got to look around to throw. He doesn't know who's coming up on him from behind. Boom, nail him. Number 27 over there, J.K. J.D. Dobbins. He's a really good running back. Uh, you got to stop him, too. If you can stop the running game, you force Lamar into the pocket where he's got to throw to become one-dimensional. You sit back and you wait for him. It's kind of a, a standard operating procedure against any team, but with the Baltimore Ravens, this becomes paramount. The Steelers, on the other hand, doesn't matter who you have, right? You got to have that running game. I keep shouting that over and over. Got to have that running game. You got a new quarterback, Kenny Pickens. Uh, he's not Ben Roethlisberger quite yet. Everyone's spoiled because Big Ben came out and was immediately successful. And, um, you, you know, it doesn't always work that way. You don't always get that lucky. And even in his first year, they did a lot of running. And then the passing game will come along when it comes along. So they're playing an Akersure Stadium. These two teams don't like each other. They know each other pretty well. We've beaten up on Lamar before. He finally beat us for the first time last year, right? We're 3-1 uh, we're and one against this guy. So what is my prediction? What do I think is going to happen? Akersure Stadium on Sunday. What do you think I'm going to say, huh? <laughs> We're going to crush the Ravens, man. The one thing about Mr. H, he is always going to take his Steelers side. Even if there's no hope, I still go fighting, just like it's Thermopylae. And believe me, at the end of the day, it's just a game, so don't get into a bar fight over this, okay? <laughs> you guys have yourself a fantastic day. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to watch the Steelers and Ravens. I'm going to write in my book a little bit more, more on that later on. Have a great day. Keep it safe. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And das Vidanya.